Hey guys, Joe back at it once again with some OCR FSMQ past papers and today we have the June 2015 examination paper. Now sorry that the, the video is out a little bit later, I actually forgot to record this video. Uh, so we'll get into it and hopefully it'll be up uh, for the usual, well not the usual time tonight because it's already uh, past 6 o'clock. So yeah, let's get into things. Uh, oh by the way, if you've missed any of the papers so far, they're in a playlist on the channel. And uh, we'll also be doing the specimen paper in addition to this. So let's get into things. Question 1 then. Find the equation of the line which is perpendicular to the line 2x plus 3y equals 5 and which passes through the point 3, 4. Well, uh, first of all you've got to rearrange uh, this equation up here into this form here. Uh, and then divide both sides by 3 and that is in the form y equals mx plus c. So I can now see that my gradient is minus two thirds. Therefore, um, if it's perpendicular, the new grad is going to be three over two because it's a negative reciprocal of minus two over three. And then I go to y minus b equals mx minus a. I've got a point, got a gradient, put the numbers in like that. Times throw by two to get that. Take the eight over the other side, I get that. So first question done, two y equals three x minus one. But any acceptable form after this part, once you've tidied the numbers up, is absolutely fine. <clears throat> Question 2 then. Find alpha in the range of 0 to 180, such that tan alpha equals minus 1.5. So the first step is to put it into your calculator, and you get the shift tan of minus 1.5 is minus 56.69, but you're not done yet, because we want it in the range of 0 to 180. So remember tan solutions come every 180 degrees, so you keep adding 180 until you get out of the extreme uh, upper limit. And there's only one answer in this case, and it's 126.69 degrees. <coughs> Similarly, find beta in the range of 0 to 180, such that beta, sin beta equals 0.2. So get your calculator involved, do the shift sin of it, and you get 11.54. But remember, um, the, if we look at the sine graph, uh, it repeats itself like that, and the line node point uh, 2 is up here somewhere, so you're going to get two solutions before you even hit 180. So remember, you have to do 180 minus the answer, and you'll get that. So you've got 11.54 and 168.46. Question 3 then, find the equation of the tangent to the curve y equals x cubed plus 3x minus 5 at the point 2, 9. So, Go get a gradient. I've got my point, need my gradient, so I differentiate with respect to x power to the front, not one off the power, and I get that. Put my x coordinate through, and I get do y dx equals 15. So that must be my gradient of the tangent. That is what I want. y minus b equals mx minus a. Put in your numbers, expand, tidy, job done. Question 4 then. Find the definite integral between 2 and 1 of x squared plus 2x plus 3. So that's that. Add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. Put your 2 in, put your 1 in, take them off each other, get that. Which is that? 25 over 3. No units required here, it's just the definite integral, nothing to do with area. So now we're going to interpret our answer geometrically. So, uh, when you see the, the integration, it means the area between uh, 2 and 0, so at uh, 2 and 1, sorry, in this case. Uh, so therefore it's the area under the curve between x equals 2 and 1, so if we if we think of, of the curve here, so that's a positive x squared graph goes up. Uh, well, just for example's sake, it, it goes up like that. It doesn't, but we'll say it does. Then we'll put up a goal post at, at 2 and 1, and we're wanting that area there. That is what uh, it'll tell us. So it's between the x-axis, x equals 2, and x equals 1. So that's that's what you're doing there. Question 5 then. A train accelerates from rest uh, from a point O such that t seconds after the displacement... Uh, sorry, after t seconds the displacement in s metres from O is given by the formula s equals 3 halves of t squared minus 2t plus 3. Show by calculus that the acceleration is con constant. So the relationship between displacement and acceleration means you have to differentiate twice. So I diff once, 
uh, ds dt, which is the same as velocity. So we'll get that. Now differentiate me velocity, dv dt, which is also a. And a is a 3. Th 3 is a constant. Uh, it will never change no matter what t is. It's not variable. <clears throat> uh, second bar, find the ve velocity after 5 seconds. So when t equals 5, v equals 3 times 5 minus 2, because of my velocity equation up here. Put them in, v equals 13. Job done. Question 6 then. You were given that n is a positive integer, uh, and n minus 1, n, and n plus 1 are three consecutive integers. In each of the following cases, form an equation in n and solve it. So the three integers add up to 99. Well, that's just the addition of them all. Set it equal to 99. Tidy up, you get 3n equals 99, divide both sides by 3, n must be a 33. And if you think about it, 32, 33 and 34 do add up to 99. Um, and the consecutive as well. Uh, part 2. Uh, when the product of the first integer and the third integer is added to 5 times the second integer, the sum is 203. So the product of the first and the third is just squeeze the brackets together and you get that. And 5 of the second integer is 5n, and that's set equal to 203. Expand, please, you get that, which is that, which actually factorizes to that. So n is a positive number, it's told in the first line, therefore n equals 12. If you put 17 there as well, you would have dropped a mark, you have to read the question, unfortunately. Right then, question 7. Uh, solve algebraically the simultaneous equations y equals that and y equals that. So, if I see a y here, I can paste that into there and call this equal to this. So I do that. And I tidy up and I get that. And that's a beautiful quadratic because that factorizes to that which is that, uh, so x equals 2 and then you put the 2 back in uh, one of these 2 add 7 is 9 therefore y is a 9 so the line and the curve only meet once so if you think about this you've got that, you've got the line coming through uh, there's only one place that meets and that's a 2 comma 9 and you know when something goes past the curve and it just kisses once it is a tangent to the curve at the point 2, 9. And you could have proved that by differentiating um, this thing and uh, then putting the, uh, well, getting your gradient by putting this x coordinate through and then doing y minus b equals mx minus a, and you should end up with that. Question 8 then, the cubic polynomial f of x equals that, where a is a constant, has a factor of x plus 3. Find the value of a. So if you know that uh, x plus 3 is a factor, you can put a minus 3 through and set it equal to 0. So that's what I've done. Taking people over the other side, you get that. Divide by 3, you get a to be a minus 7. And then uh, you divide that in, x plus 3 into uh, the cubic which you've worked out what the a is now and you divide it in and you get that uh, I think that's alright because you end up with zero at the bottom so that means you you know you're doing it right and you've got a new quadratic at the top so you get that you squeeze them together factorize the second one you get that your three answers are that job done question nine then the equation of the circle C is that Express the, the equation of C in the form x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals r squared. Now this is the hardest form of circle question you can be asked. So uh, I wish I hadn't animated it like that. But we're going to first focus on the x-y parts. Just complete the square twice uh, on the y's as well. So we're going to half the coefficient of x. So your x minus 4. You square it all, but when we expand that again, we would get x squared minus 8x, which is what we want, because we've got that. But we'll also get plus 16, and that's an unwanted plus 16, so we have to take that off afterwards. And similarly with that, um, we're half the coefficient of y, we say y plus 1, but when we expand that, we'll get uh, y squared plus 2x, 
y squared plus 2y, which is what we want. We'll also get an unwanted plus 1, so we have to take that off. And the minus 19 stays there because we haven't touched them yet. And then we take people over the other side and we get like that. So there you go, that is in the form the examiner wanted you to leave it in. Hence or otherwise, use an algebraic method to decide whether the point that a3 lies inside, outside, or on the circumference of the circle. Show all your work. So if you test uh, whether a point is on a circle, on a line, or anything, you let the algebra dictate it. So this will tell you that any x minus 4 squared add any y plus 1 squared should equal 36 if it's on the outer rim of the circle. So we'll just let x equal 8 and y equal 3. So we'll get that. Square them up and you get that. And that's 32. Now 32 is less than 36, therefore a3 must be inside the circle because it's less than. So that's that. Uh, question 10. Pretty, pretty nasty question this one actually. Figure 10 shows a partly open window or A uh, viewed from above. The window is hinged at O. Okay. Uh, when the window is closed, the end A is at the point B. The window is kept open by a rod C, where C D sorry, where C is a fixed point on the line O B. The point D slides along a fixed bar E F. When the window is closed, D is at F. Uh, when the window is fully open, D is at E. And you're given a load of values there. But I am just going to cut to the chase. Uh, there's a lot to take in. But bottom line is the cosine rule, the angle EOC, which is this one here. When it's fully open, so uh, when it when it's fully open, D is at E. So that means that is there, and you've got that there. That's still going to be 7, by the way, so you use that. You've got the three sides, <clears throat> and you get that. Hold on, what is D, actually? D well, D is just that point, actually. Never mind. Uh, so you get that, which is that. Get your calculator involved, you get 44.1. Now, this is the hard part. The distance OD when angle EOC is 30. So it's cosine rule again but we're now going to call this distance here x. And, uh, is it? Uh, no, no, oh, that's still 7. We're going to call this x because that is the variable point. So we'll do 7 squared equals x squared plus 8 squared minus 2x8 cos 30. And we'll get that, believe it or not, which is that. If you want to factorise that, you can, but I just quadratic formula it and got that, which is x equals 12.7. You will get a minus answer as well, but obviously you can have a negative length, as I've mentioned in the past, and you get 12.7. Bit of a nasty question, that one. Question 11 then, lovely question, this one. Two curves, S1 and S2, have equations y equals x squared minus 4x plus 7, and y equals 6x minus x squared minus 1, respectively. The curves meet at A and at B. Show that the coordinates of A are 1, 4 and 4, 7, respectively. Right, well, shown uh, uh, the coordinates of A and B, that is the two points where the curves meet. Where do curves meet? Well, that's when their algebra is equal to each other, so I see a y here. So that means I can paste this in for this y here and call it that. Take people over the other side to get that. Divide through by 2 to get that. Factorise to get that. x equals 4 or 1. I'm liking it. 1 and 4. And then if I put that back through, I get me y to be 7 and 4. So I'm really, really liking that. Because it's right. <laughs> Points P and Q lie on S2 and S1 between A and B. P and Q have the same X coordinates so that PQ is parallel to the Y axis as shown in Fig one, uh, Fig 11. Sorry. Find an expression in its simplest form for the length PQ as a function of X. Well, uh, PQ is the ceiling to the floor because if you think about it, that is, um, that is the algebra at the top because that's the y coordinate, so y equals 
um, that on the top and that point there is y equals that and the distance that is the big distance so from 0 to p so from here to p minus the distance from q to, to 0 so that is our distance there so that's why it's assumed to hit the floor like that so taking them away from each other you get that so that's what pq is use calculus to find the greatest length of pq well uh, to find the greatest length obviously you're going to have to differentiate it so we've now got an expression for pq so we're going to do dp dpq by dx and you get that power to the front not one off the power we need to set that equal to zero to work out a greatest length a maximum length whatever uh, there you go so you have 4x equals 10 x must be 2.5 uh, find the area between the two curves so we'll do this well we know we're goal posts from the oof, that's an awful line we know we know we're goal posts from the first question that's at 4 that's at 1 therefore uh, the area in between is the integration between 4 and 1 of the ceiling to the floor because that's the area between two curves which is that because that is the ceiling to the floor it's a lovely flowing question this which is that add 1 to the power divide by the new power shove your 4 through, shove your 1 through take them off each other you get that, you get that and then 9 units squared Question 12 then. Uh, a distributor of flower bulbs has a large number of tulip bulbs and daffodil bulbs, mixed in the ratio 1 to 3 respectively. He packs the bulbs in boxes, he puts 10 bulbs chosen at random in each box. Find the probability that a box chosen at random contains exactly 4 daffodil bulbs. bulbs. Well, x can be binomially distributed as 10,0.75 for daffodils and 0.25 for tulips because 3 to 1 obviously it's a quarter for um, tulip and 3 quarters for daffodil so you get that exactly 4 is so the p of x equals 4 but that's the same as 10 c 4 times 0.75 to the 4 times 0.25 to the rest which is that once you turn your calculator on now at least one tulip bulb the p of x is greater than or equal to 1 is the same as 1 minus none so you get that which is that which is that and uh, the final bit two boxes of bulbs are chosen at random find the probability that there is a total of three tulip bulbs in the two boxes so now we're talking about uh, the tulips two boxes so there's going to be 20 flowers to choose from still going to be 0.25 of a chance uh, for a tulip uh, p of x equals 3 because it's exactly 3 remember so it's 20 c3 times success to the 3 times failure to the rest and then you get that so not a bad binomial question that one uh, not too bad at all Question 13 then, this had me in bits, and I still don't really get it to be honest with you. But uh, the last bit at least, the, the first bits I'm okay with. So Gardner marks out a rec regular hexagon A, B, C, D, F, E, F on his horizontal garden. Each side of the hexagon is 0.5 metres. Uh, the gardener sticks a cane in the ground at each point of the hexagon. He joins the six canes at V, where V is vertically above the centre O uh, of the hexagon, as shown in Fig 13. Each cane has a length of 2.4 metres from the ground to V. So OA, uh, well, what we're first doing here is the vertical height of V above the ground. So OA, if we think about that, that must be 0 0.5, because we're told uh, it's a regular hexagon, hexagon with each side equal in 0 0.5. So through Pythagoras then, OV, if we just dot that down, if we think of this triangle here, it's not bad drawn, because uh, that is a right angle there, remember. Uh, so through Pythagoras, OV squared equals 2.4 squared minus 0.5. I'm using that information there, 2.4 metres, and I get OV to equal 2.35. 
and that's three sig figs. The angle between each cane and the ground, well that's that angle there I think. So that's going to be 0.5 over 2.4, opposite over adjacent, uh, I think is it? Or adjacent, no no it's uh, adjacent over the hypotenuse because that's x, that's for little a, that's for h. Adjacent over hypotenuse, I think that's about 78 degrees, believe it or not. But that's not three sig sig significant figures, so I think I've dropped a mark there. Uh, the angle between the plane VAB and the ground, well, let M be the midpoint of AB. Uh, I'm just going to clear the ink here. Uh, so I'll erase all ink on the slide. Okay, we'll turn the pen off, stupid idiot. Right, so we'll call that M there. So if we join these three points up, that's not bad. And then coming down, that's perfect. Uh, OM squared equals 0 0.5 squared minus 0 0.25 squared, because obviously that length fits the midpoint of 0 0.5. It's going to be 0 0.25, isn't it? So you get that. <clears throat> uh, but we want the angle. So VMO is going to be 2.35 over 0 0.433. Uh, so theta equals that. I think it's actually, yeah, well, because OM, yeah, so it must be the cost, the shift cost of that, but check that out in your own time. And this is the bit that absolutely threw me. I wouldn't have got the marks on an exam. The gardener stretches a horizontal wire around the structure to strengthen it. He fixes the wire to each cane at a point one metre vertically above the ground. Find the length of the wire. Well, that there is the answer. Now it's very very vague but uh, it's to do with similar shapes and when you've got the cane it'll end up being a small, a slightly smaller hexagon and uh, you know, something like that. But bottom line is if you get an answer of 1.72 at the end you're on the right lines but I kind of get my head around this geometry if you like and it's it's just really nasty and for the sake of three marks, don't worry about it. Really don't worry about it. They're not going to ask it this year, because it was on last year's paper. But it might be something to go over with your teacher at school. and yeah, that, That's what I had to do. I had to go to my teacher and uh, actually ask, but I still don't really understand it. Um, well, I did at the time, but I don't now. Um, but it is to do with scale factors and stuff like that. Question 14 then. Uh, a company produces two bottles of liquids, X and Y. There's two ingredients, A and B, in each liquid. The table shows the quantities in centiliters of A and B needed to make each bottle of liquid. Each day the company can produce um, 84 of A and 90 of B. From this inf information, an analyst writes down that an inequality for X plus 3Y is less than that. Explain what X and Y stand for in this inequality and explain what the inequality models. Well, X is the number of bottles uh, X produced, obviously. Y is the number of bottles Y produced. Nice easy two marks there. But the inequality represents the quantity of A, because it's going to be 4X plus 3Y is less than or equal to 84, because we've got 4, 3, 84. <coughs> Uh, what's the second bit? Use this information to get write down another inequality that's just using 2, 5, 90. Easy peasy. Uh, on the grid, draw that. So hopefully that's nice and clear for you. Use, use the cover-up method, that's what I do to draw me graphs. Uh, and the company needs to produce the same numbers of bottles of X and Y each day. Find the maximum number of bottles uh, X and Y can, can produce. Trial and error will just give you a max is 12, 12. Um, obviously, uh, the same number of bottles would imply Y equals X, which would, oh dear me, would probably make you draw a straight line through the origin, but that is horrendous, horrific. Um, but I, uh, just through trial and error, I got my max to be 12, 12. I think I just 
worked around this area here and just kind of fiddled around with it until I got numbers that were the same and worked with me inequalities that I made. It's it's all a bit blase, but, but it's, it's very wishy-washy and for two marks. I don't really know what else you can do. Uh, but on one day, the company does not have to produce the same numbers of bottles X and Y. Write down the maximum numbers of bottles that can be produced and all the combinations that will give this maximum. So, maximum is 24, so you could have 10, 14, 11, 13, 12, 12. It's, it's as straightforward as that, that last bit. Um, so, yeah, that is that. And that is the 2015 paper. It's a bit of a nasty one, to be honest with you. It's it's okay in places, but they try and trip you up a lot. And you can see why there's a, a, a Hitler React video on YouTube to this. So you might want to go check that out. Um, but obviously leave any questions down below that you have. I'll do my best to answer them. But uh, yeah, we've come to, towards the end uh, of our official... OCR past papers um, series, I guess. We've done all the lessons, we've done all the official past papers. We've got one more to go, a specimen paper. Um, and that'll be coming up in a couple of days' time. Uh, so, hopefully, you guys have found this helpful. If I'm sounding really weird in the last sort of three, four minutes of the video, it's because I'm holding back a sneeze and it's it's not great. Um, but yeah, hopefully you've found it helpful. Please leave a like if you did. Uh, obviously you don't have to, but it'll, it'll mean a lot for the channel and, and you know expose the content, um, get fellow people doing OCR uh, aware of the channel. And obviously um, on the day of the exam, which is 6th of June, I'll hopefully be getting my personal solutions up within the, the the couple of days after the exam but obviously I, I've got exams in this period as well so uh, we'll see we'll see how it goes uh, even if I just scan my handwritten answers up uh, it might be better than nothing uh, try and explain me way through them but um, yeah not long to go now so best of luck if you take now on 6th of June and, uh, and, and thanks for watching even just a minute of any of the videos it really does help and hopefully it's helping you so yeah I've waffled on for about 10 minutes but uh, yeah thanks for watching and goodbye